Welcome to Sunday Assembly. This is our 94th Assembly and our 25th Online Assembly. Uh, the humans here in the room have been, it's just amazing, 94, we're going to do it, we're going to reach 100. I remember when we were on our 3rd or 4th or 5th or 17th Assembly thinking, wow, 100, won't that be something? And here we are in this rarefied air. We are calling, we are a, a hybrid assembly, we're calling this. That means there's some people that are watching on Zoom. So for the people that are watching on Zoom, hello. And um, we call those people Azoomblers, uh, just to distinguish them. And the people that are in the room, we call them Azoomblers. So Azoomblers meet Azoomblers, Azoomblers meet Azoomblers. Um, wasn't, wasn't that in West Side Story? Weren't those two groups? Yes, I think that was them. it. Yes. When you're a Zoomer, you're a Zoomer all the way. Yep. For, for a cigarette, your last dying day. I think that's, that's the one. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, every assembly has a theme, and today's theme is orbits. Uh, my name is Michelle Soden. I'll be your MC for today. We have a media-free zone uh, that is uh, this area. Well, I won't even point at it, so we don't even know where it is because it's media free. Um, uh, so if you, we are recording this event, so if you don't want to be digitally recorded, please uh, let us know so that, I mean, please sit over there. And that, um, uh, we do have childcare. Uh, we have childcare professionals that have been with us. And I, you know, I have been so remiss. I need to bring them out sometime and have you meet them because they've done a, such a great job from us, from our old venue at the Women's Club all the way here. The, um, the, the, the people, they're, they're educators and they've just done been phenomenal and they come uh, here and take care of the children. But we have child care here, so if you want uh, yeah, an hour and a half respite from the kids, maybe just to bring them on in here, even if you're not interested in anything that's happening. But how can you not be? Orbits. Uh, sing along with Paul Svensson, that's what we're going to go right to. Uh, welcome to Sunday Assembly, Mr. Paul Svensson. Wait, hold, hold on, hold on, hold on, everyone. Hold on, hold on. Hold on. I was just about to say something. I know. Mm. You were. I'm being quiet. And then I realized that um, I hadn't told anybody what Sunday Assembly is about. Um, but I don't need to because you're going to sing, Paul. Let's do it. Welcome to Sunday Assembly, written by Mr. Paul Svensson. Good morning, everybody. Why don't we all stand up a little bit and do some singing here? So if you don't know this song, you're going to know it in about 30 seconds, at least your part. It goes like this. Welcome to Sunday Assembly. I look round the room and must say, two familiar old faces and new ones. We're glad that you came here today. Here's the chorus. We're glad that you came here today. Hey, we're glad that you came here today. Your old faces and new ones We're glad that you came here today It was almost, almost audible We, we are going to do better on the next one right. Which is just like the first one with different words And when the assembly is over We hope that you don't have to run We'd really like to get to know you so stick around after we're done oh stick around after we're done oh stick around after we're done we'd really like to get to know you so stick around after we're done we like to sing songs when we gather so rock pop and ballads we croon we raise up our voices in verses and sometimes we sing them in tune oh sometimes we sing them in tune no sometimes we sing them in tune we raise up our voices in verses and sometimes we sing them in tune and when we're all done with the program and after we sing the last song introduce yourselves to one another and you won't be a stranger for long no you won't you won't be a stranger for long no you won't be a stranger for long we to one another and you won't be a stranger last verse so welcome to sunday assembly we greet you with wide open door we're 
certainly glad that you joined us to live better, help often wonder more. Live better, help often wonder more. Live better, help often wonder more. Certainly glad that you joined us to live better, help often wonder more. Lovely. So, um, I, you all may sit, please. I uh, got up this morning and just felt pretty horrible. And so I took a shower and got dressed and came down here to help set up and continue to feel horrible. And so I am going to leave right now. But you'll have surprises for the last two songs that may look like me, but it won't be me here. It will be me at another place. Anyway, peace to you all. Have a great, have a great everything, you guys. Feel better, Paul. Love you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hate to embarrass him, but a true consummate professional. Um, well, here we are at Sunday Assembly. Sunday Assembly is a secular community that, uh, non-religious community that meets monthly to hear uh, great talks. We have a fantastic speaker today um, to connect for community events, to uh, share some snacks, to sing some songs, but mostly we get together to celebrate this one life that we know that we have. The theme for Sunday Assembly or the motto for Sunday Assembly is live better, help often, and wonder more. That's something that we all help each other do. And uh, uh, Paul wrote that song, and uh, it just, uh, I don't know, it just gets, I, I'll, have this, I'll have this stuck in my, uh, my head for most of the rest of the day and probably part of tomorrow. But I feel like I should have a, like a schooner in my hand, you know, it's like it's a drinking song. So anyways, um, how many of this is your first time to Sunday Assembly? If you wouldn't mind, just, just show us a free handshake. So if you wouldn't mind just saying... Just say, uh, give, a, give a virtual high five to those people to say welcome and thank you for coming and joining us today. Um, we have a thing that we do that is called Life Happens. I see um, Life Happens and it's uh, where we ask assemblers to share some things that have happened in their life. It helps us stay connected and I think that's um, you know, the things we like to know about our friends. Uh, and so I will share with you. Uh, Rachel and Steve hosted some, oh, I'm sorry, could you just tell me the word there? Oh, I'm sorry. No. <laughs> sorry. Um, they hosted some, uh, some uh, families, some guest families from uh, Syria uh, from a high school uh, graduation. Uh, do you, what, you, can you tell me what it is? Oh, God. And nobody got COVID. <laughs> Thank you so much. So much better when you say, Kristen. Uh, um, Louis is very happy for their sister got a, uh, Louis is very happy for their sister who got a full-time job in Oregon. Uh, Laura, will get the, uh, Laura will get to Visit Kayla up there. I'm so sorry. I don't have my glasses, and I really apologize for that. So um, I can already hear my, feel my spouse's eyes on the side of my head for doing that. Sorry, I slaughtered that. Um, uh, Louis, would you care to tell us uh, what that is specifically? Okay. Yeah, somebody else come up and read this. Thank you. There's two more here. I'm sorry. Well, we yeah, do Perfect. that one, that one, and then I'll, I'll add okay. one in and out. I'm sorry. Glasses. Okay. Blind solidarity. Betsy is babysitting for three weeks for a miniature pincer named Judy Garland. She is adorable. <laughs> Lewis, we read. Okay. The Record Wesley family, which is my family, is going to a medical conference next week to see all the doctors and specialists who they haven't seen in a while who help their kids walk and be more functional. Looking forward to it, but wish it wasn't in Florida. Wow, that was way better. Thank you so much. Um, I want to share Life Happens. Uh, I'll try to do as briefly as possible, but um, 
during COVID assemblies or Zoom assemblies, we had, uh, I, I talked about a uh, rock snake that's in uh, Imperial Beach. The Imperial Beach rock snake, something started at the beginning of COVID and people painted rocks. And they put them down there and um, it became uh, Ivy Rocks and then Ivy Rock Snake. And uh, it's, I went, drove by, I rode my bicycle pass because it's on the bike path uh, just the other day yesterday, as a matter of fact, and uh, it's grown almost all the way to the end of this particular part of the path. Some of the rocks being, uh, some of the stones being stones that we painted and put there. And it's just so delightful to see the, the seasons and, uh, and people's points of view and the love messages and things, uh, and, and also the little rocks that say, please don't take rocks from the rock snake. Um, I had uh, talked about my, this rock that had hope on it that had been taken and um, I, we eventually assumed that it was just somebody that needed it. So I was happy with that. But, uh, sorry, I, this is meaningful to me, so I'm sorry. I am not gonna do this the whole assembly, I don't think. Uh, so, uh, one of the assemblers told one of their friends, gosh, I can do this. One of the assemblers told one of their friends who is an artist, uh, this is an artist who recently lost a leg and was having a lot of trouble. And the quest, request had um, come through and it had been quite a bit of time um, and this person was doing the rehabilitation and, and getting prosthetics that were as acceptable and working through the process. And so uh, the similar thought, perhaps this person had forgot or neglected or it's just something they couldn't get to, which is perfectly understandable, but this artist painted this rock to place the rock. So much And I also want to be able to talk for the rest of the assembly, so that's it, no more crying from anybody. <laughs> Not acceptable. All right, let's move on, shall we? <laughs> Help happens. Uh, Jen is going to talk to us about our beach cleanup coming up. Good morning. So um, next Sunday, June 26th, we are holding a beach cleanup at our adopted beach at South Shores, which is on Mission Bay right next to SeaWorld. Uh, we'll be there from 10 to 12 in the morning and all supplies are provided for the cleanup. If you would like more information, see me after the assembly or you can check out the event on Meetup or Facebook and I hope you will join us. And I also am the person for our reading this morning, so I will just continue. <laughs> okay. Uh, Antidotes to Fear of Death by Rebecca Elson. Sometimes, as an antidote to fear of death, I eat the stars. Those nights, lying on my back, I suck them from the quenching dark till they are all, all inside me, pepper hot and sharp. Sometimes, instead, I stir myself into a universe still young, still warm as blood. No outer space, just space the light of all the not yet stars drifting like a bright mist, and all of us and everything already there, but unconstrained by form. And sometimes it's enough to lie down here on earth beside our long ancestral bones, to walk across the cobble fields of our discarded skulls, each like a treasure, like a chrysalis, thinking, whatever left these husks flew off on bright wings. That was beautiful and beautifully read, Jen, thank you. Um, I, we are so pleased to have our speaker today, Lisa Will. Uh, Lisa Will earned her BS in astrophysics from UCLA and her PhD in physics from the Arizona State University. She is a professor of astronomy and physics at San Diego City College, and she is San Diego City College, and she is also the resident astronomer at the Fleet Science Center and the co-host of Astronomy on Tap San Diego. She has researched the nature of dust grains in space and innovations in astronomy education. She is obsessed with Star Wars, the MCU, Doctor Who, and uh, has been a proud geek girl since watching Star Trek and Star Wars as a child. She lives in San Diego with her husband, science fiction and fantasy author Greg Van Eckhout. I didn't know, if, I didn't ask for a pronunciation on it, and their dog, please correct me. We're so pleased to have her here. Welcome, Lisa.
All right, thank you so much for that kind introduction. I really appreciate the uh, invitation to be here with you today. Uh, hopefully you can hear me clearly through the microphone. I've been doing talks and teaching classes with masks now for like months, so I'm just used to this now. Um, so what I am here to talk to you about today is uh, losing the sky. And uh, there's stuff going on um, that uh, I think the public isn't generally aware of that's happening to your night sky. So I thought we would all talk about it together and talk about maybe some things that you can do about it. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna wander back and forth. Cause I always end up pacing during talks anyway. So let's see. Um, you might be wondering what those streaks are in this image of the nighttime sky. Let's see, we'll get the lights down a little bit more. So um, a lot of times when you see pictures of the night sky, what you're actually seeing are what we call long exposure images of the sky so that you could actually see some of the stuff that you normally can't see with the naked eyes. So. Um, this image uh, that we'll be looking at here is one taken in a national park in Western Australia. And what you're supposed to see are stars and stuff, but there's all these streaks that are moving in random directions. And those streaks are kind of important to understand what I'm talking about. I like the dark. I heard some of you talk about the solstice and the longest day of year. I'm just like, let's get back to longer hours of not darkness, okay? Um, so um, this is a, a, a national park in Western Australia where there are these uh, rock forms called pinnacles. And um, in this long uh, exposure photograph, the uh, telescope moves with the sky. So if you've ever played with a telescope that has a motor, it actually moves with the sky so that the, it moves with the rotation of the earth. And so everything should stay fixed. Um, if you just take a camera, Yes, let's get it completely dark. Okay, so um, I give talks in planetaria. This is bright for me. Um, so uh, so uh, if you actually set up a camera on a tripod and just leave it the shutter open for longer, you'll see the stars trail across the sky because you're not taking into account the Earth's rotation. So if these were stars causing these streaks, they would all be moving together. But you're seeing a bunch of streaks here at random directions, but they're not actually too random. You'll notice that we can label a lot of them, and a lot of them have the word Starlink in front of them. Okay, and so what we're going to talk about today are satellites up in orbit, and what some of those satellites are, how many there are of them, how many of them are going up, and whether or not you should be comfortable with the sheer amount of them that are going up right now. So let's actually define some orbit, shall we? So what I have here is a diagram of the different orbital distances, as we call them, from the Earth. And there, that big green one is sort of mid-Earth orbit. There's a red one all the way to the side that's high Earth orbit. And there's this tiny blue zone all the way closest to the Earth that's called low Earth orbit. That's where the space station is. That's where the Hubble Space Telescope is. Um, different satellites and different uh, spacecraft uh, occupy different orbits. A lot of the geosynchronous satellites that are weather satellites, they're way further out. Communication satellites tend to be further in. And so um, low Earth orbit is probably is the most, um, well, we'll talk about how it's getting populated. But basically, communication satellites, weather satellites, Defense Department satellites from uh, governments all over the world, um, and more and more recently, more communication satellites that are used for satellite internet are being launched. Now, do these satellites stay up in orbit forever? And the answer is no. Orbits actually do decay uh, for many different reasons. In low Earth orbit, actually, um, so we tend to think of the atmosphere as being like atmosphere, no atmosphere, but it's actually atmosphere getting thinner, 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 thinner. And so uh, low Earth orbit is, is uh, so like the Hubble Space Telescope is in low Earth orbit, and I like to call it the Hubble just above the atmosphere telescope. 
Um, so there actually are some, still some atmospheric particles up there. Um, there's gravitary, gravitational variations in the Earth's own gravitational field, minor ones. Uh, there is pressure from the solar wind. Things can cause satellite orbits to decay over time, but most often it's atmospheric drag. So we have um, a couple of options with satellites. We can intentionally deorbit them, which is what uh, NASA tends to do with its large telescope. So eventually, as the Hubble Space Telescope comes to the end of its lifetime, uh, NASA will intentionally deorbit it, which is a fancy way of saying we crash it to a specific place. All right. And there's a place in the ocean where we intentionally crash stuff, sort of like where you get so it's a boat free zone so that people can uh, not be hurt when we intentionally do orbit things. The other option you can do is actually change their orbits up into what we call the satellite graveyard, put them into a really, 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 really high orbit where it would take a very, very long time for them to fall back down in terms of thousands of years. But all of those are predicated on your spacecraft actually having fuel on them to change their orbits. Basically, you got a plan to deorbit your satellite when you launch it. Um, or otherwise, it'll just naturally decay and fall back down. Um, so, why is that important? Well, there, we we actually know the we know the number of satellites that are in orbit. And we can track them, we can see them from the ground. Uh, sometimes though, we make more debris up in orbit. Um, some of them are intentional. Uh, there was, uh, Russia did an anti-satellite test last November. And an anti-satellite test is basically when you actually shoot a missile at a satellite and destroy it. But it doesn't go into nothing, it breaks up into debris. And so what you'll notice here, this is data taken from this past week where we're still tracking the debris from that uh, satellite, anti-satellite uh, anti -satellite detonation. And so this, uh, this test caused 787 pieces of debris greater in size than 10 centimeters to be put into orbit. And you're like, 10 centimeters? What, that's like yay big, right? You're like, well, who cares? You don't wanna hit, get hit by that. Right, because in orbit, low Earth orbit, when I always think of the Hubble Space Telescope takes about 95 minutes to orbit the Earth once. It's going fast. So I don't care how small an object is, it's going fast. If it runs into your spacecraft, your satellite, it would be uh, a problem. So this is an intentional case of adding orbital debris. You might be wondering with all these satellites up there, have there ever been accidental collisions? And the answer is yes. Um, the first known, we'll call it unintentional collision between two satellites happened in uh, 2009, where there was a communication satellite, uh, a Russian communication satellite that was no longer operational and it actually hit an operational US communication satellite. And both satellites were destroyed and put in literally millions of pieces, tiny, 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 tiny little pieces of debris. Um, this debris cloud, it goes into a general idea of stuff that we call space junk in astronomy. So if you've ever heard the term space junk, it's uh, actually uh, how low Earth orbit in particular is getting littered with a lot of objects, both operational and intentional and unintentional. Yeah, they're actually, yeah, they're very similar to what we're doing to the oceans. Um, and so I think um, oftentimes we think because space is big that there's plenty of room for everything out there. But in this case, I think you saw how thin low Earth orbit was in reality. And as we put more and more stuff up there, it is uh, more and more difficult to actually uh, uh, keep that area as clean as we would like. So this is actually an image of more than 19,000 satellites. Um, these are the ones that are both functional and non-functional currently that we could track. Uh, besides currently operating spacecraft, of which there are about 5,000, there's almost 5,000 operating spacecraft in orbit. 
there's a bunch of other stuff. Um, all the non-operational spacecraft. Uh, the boosters that we use to send some of these spacecraft up. If you've ever watched uh, satellite launches, because we can watch that now, right? It's so cool. They put webcams on parts of the spacecraft. You can watch the whole launch as it goes up, and you see the boosters falling away. Some of them fall all the way back down into the ocean. Some of the boosters that uh, give a kick higher up um, stay up in orbit. Um, as we saw, there's debris from weapons testing and collisions. We are tracking about a million pieces a centimeter and smaller uh, in orbit. Um, and then there's just lost equipment, which sounds silly, but there's a glove up there. There's a wrench up there. Sometimes uh, the astronauts up in spacewalks, they lose things. But now, now we traditionally have them tethered. But yeah, no, that wrench just goes flying away and it doesn't fall back down to Earth. It actually goes into orbit for long periods of time. So uh, we have uh, low Earth orbit is basically littered with debris. Uh, you might notice something that looks more like a specific ring there. That's actually higher up. That's geo geosynchronous orbit. Geosynchronous means to, ro to uh, go in time with the Earth. And so all the satellites that are in geosynchronous orbit have to be at the same distance from the Earth. So that's why you get this ring around the Earth in that case. So as I mentioned, right now there are more than 21,000 pieces of orbital debris that are larger than 10 centimeters, estimated half million between one and 10 centimeters, and over 100 million actually. We can't track all of those, but there's an estimated uh, 100 million that are actually smaller than one centimeter. So we are tracking a lot of these particles actually because we need to know where they are. And you might be wondering why, why does it actually help us if we know where they are? Well, yeah, we do need to track them because sometimes they hit things we really do care about, especially sometimes they hit things where people are in them. So uh, what you have over here on the right is an image of the cupola on the International Space Station. There is a tiny little room on the space station which has windows. Has to be the best view ever, right? Just looking down on the Earth all the time. That little uh, dot over in the left-hand image is a pit in the windows of the cupola from a collision from one of these particles. And we do actually have to worry about them, the natural particles as well, the little micrometeorites and stuff like that that just fly in from space that astronomers really like. That's, that means space comes to us, but not exactly something you want to happen uh, if you're a space station. Or a telescope, uh, the JWST telescope, uh, actually got hit by a micrometeorite um, just a few weeks ago. Uh, but. Uh, so certain of those things you can't control, the other ones you would like to be able to know when they are happening. So you might be wondering, does the sheer amount of stuff up in orbit actually cause, uh, pose a problem other than just direct uh, collisions maybe to the space station? So there was a NASA scientist, his first name was Donald, I believe, Donald Kessler who actually estimated low Earth orbit, if it gets dense, densely populated enough, the total amount of space debris will increase as those collisions continue to happen and leading more and more collisions in a chain reaction. If you ever uh, watched the movie Gravity from a few years ago, they actually showed that very, very well. And that's basically what happened in gravity, we had a spacecraft get hit, got knocked into another one, got knocked into another one, he had cascading collisions. Um, so if this happens, uh, space exploration and satellite usage would not be feasible without rem remediation. What does that mean? That's that plan we were talking about. You either got a plan to deorbit, or you got a plan to push up into the satellite graveyard. The ultimate concern of this actually is we might not be able to send spacecraft away from the Earth anymore. So those spacecraft that go to Mars, the spacecraft that have explored Jupiter and Saturn for us, the one, the New Horizons spacecraft that got all the way out to Pluto and beyond, we wouldn't be able to get them past this ring of debris. And so it isn't just a matter of uh, worrying about specific satellites in orbit, but whether or not we can launch them safely or whether or not we can even launch stuff further away. So what are we doing about this?
This is where the problem starts. Because currently there are corporations who plan to send up more and more satellites and there is estimated going to be more than 100,000 satellites in orbit by the end of the decade. And right now, like I said, there's only about 5,000 operational ones. So you can see the huge increase uh, that is planned. So let me tell you uh, where those come from. And these are some phrases that you may have heard of uh, satellite constellations. What is a satellite constellation? Basically, a satellite constellation is a group of satellites that all work in tandem with each other. Just like your two eyes work together and your two ears work together. If you have multiple satellites working together, we call it a satellite constellation. So for example, GPS networks, those would be satellite constellations. Then there are uh, more specific ones that we call satellite internet constellations, which are specifically providing satellite internet service, which is a great thing because then you don't have to be tethered to hard lines and you don't have to be um, close enough to a wireless source. And so if you've been able to do things like use the internet on an airplane, you've likely been using satellite, uh, internet satellite uh, constellation service. So sounds like a good thing. What are mega constellations? Mega means big. Well, technically it means a million in your metric prefixes, but we're just gonna say big in this case, right? So what is a mega constellation? Um, that phrase is now used for very large satellite internet constellations in low earth orbit. So common usage has changed very quickly. Satellite constellations now often refer to these mega constellations. So what are these streaks that you see here? These are streaks of Starlink satellites going through the field of view of a professional telescope that was trying to take images of the sky. So we're going to talk about some specific uh, concerns about mega constellations for astronomy and in general. So there's a couple of things that we have to be concerned about when corporations send up all these satellites up into the sky. Um, will they find enough customers to recoup on their investments or are they just going to let these satellites fail if they're not making money? That's one thing that we have to be concerned about. Um, can these corporations then be liable for the space debris at the end of life of the satellites? What happened if their individual satellites collide? And then what are the various impacts, both literal and figurative, right, uh, of these constellations, uh, these satellite constellations? And the reason why I'm specifically mentioning corporations here is that these are private companies putting these uh, mega constellations up. And the space agencies, NASA, the European Space Agency, and so on, they actually do have plans of what to do with satellites at end of life. So it's the corporations that we're now concerned with not dealing with these. Now let's uh, talk about the most famous of the mega constellation corporations. That would be Starlink. That is SpaceX owned. And they commenced launches of these satellite uh, internet uh, uh, providers uh, in 2019 uh, and all they had to go through because their internet providers, all they had to get was FCC approval. And uh, as of May 2022, um, there's over 2,400 satellites just from Starlink in orbit. So they actually comprise about half of all of the operational satellites and uh, the vast majority of the satellites launched by anyone in the United States. Um, Starlink has received about a billion dollars in federal subsidies to provide rural internet. And that's actually the big thing, right? There's places where it's harder to lay in landlines. Um, and they have about 500,000 users worldwide currently in 33 countries, mostly in Europe. Um, and that is the most up-to-date data I could find uh, just a few days ago because I was trying to make sure that this data was up-to-date. So that's who we're worried about predominantly. This is actually an image of the first launch of them. There's, a, you can see uh, all those little things that look like canisters. There are about 60 different, uh, there's 60 of these satellites in this one launch because they're, they're fairly small objects that can be all launched all at once. So I heard, and that can be referred to as mega. 
that, that, that was the beginning of a mega constellation because now they have 2,400 of them working together, right? And so um, uh, some of this, first of all, you need to know this caught astronomers by surprise because it's not like it had to go through an environmental impact statement. It's not like it had to go through the National Science Foundation uh, or the National Academies of Sciences. SpaceX got FCC approval, they just launched. And so um, in terms of astronomy, uh, the Rubin Observatory uh, estimates that as many of, as 30% of all of their images will now uh, contain satellite trails. Um, there is a survey being done with a telescope up on Mount Palomar here in San Diego County that estimates that up to 25% of their images showed these satellites in April of this year. Um, the way we look for asteroids is to look for objects that are moving against the background of stars. This makes it much harder to look for asteroids. You want us to look for asteroids, okay? Um, and then, like I said previously, launches were approved without consultation with the scientific community. And so there had been no discussion of how this would impact astronomy. Um, SpaceX has gone to things like the American Astronomical Society meetings, and they said that they would paint the satellites a darker color so they'd be less reflective. They did that for a launch. They said it made it more difficult for some of their communications, and so they stopped doing that. And so um, that was one thing that they said they would do that they have not. But there is a larger movement that makes people want to say like, well, you know, like, so what if this impacts astronomers? There's only like 10,000 astronomers in the world, who cares, right? But let's go back to the environmental impacts. Um, it wasn't until the FCC could basically green light something like this that people realized that uh, nobody thinks of low Earth orbit as being part of the environment. Um, and that this place is considered, this space is considered a free for all for uh, development. Um, and so that was surprising to a lot of people. So the low Earth orbit environment is being altered. And there is an estimate that scattered light, so this sounds weird, right? But maybe sometimes you've been out at night and you've seen a streak of light that has moved slightly differently as a satellite catches sunlight because it's at an orbit where it can still get sunlight even though it's dark here. It is estimated that that sort of scattered light from these mega constellations may, and other orbital debris may add up to 10% more light to the night sky. So think of it, you know how here we live in a humid environment, so we go outside when it's more humid, and the, the night sky is just a little brighter. That's actually scattered light from either the moon or city lights. And so this is saying we're adding 10% more on top of that, um, up into the sky, which actually does have impacts. This light pollution, uh, we're, we're now finding that light pollution actually does have an impact on diurnal animals, especially the, those that use the sky for any sort of celestial navigation, including, uh, including uh, creatures that uh, use the light of the full moon to know when to spawn and things like that. So there's already been research over the years um, that show light pollution has an adverse impact on animal populations, and this would be adding to it. And now let us talk about the cultural impact of changing the sky. It is estimated that if those satellite constellations, that estimated 100,000 or so satellites that would get put up by Starlink, by OneWeb and Amazon. OneWeb is mostly in Europe, but you all know who Amazon is. It is estimated that in less than a decade, one out of every 15 points of light in the sky at certain times of uh, night when you look out there would be a satellite and not a star. Um, and that is, and so we're seeing that in this image. You'll notice that there are some streaks over in the right-hand side of the image. Those are those Starlink satellites, a bunch of them moving at once across the sky. And if you're wondering, can we see them from San Diego? The answer is yes. At City College, uh, uh, we have an observation deck. And so sometimes when I'm teaching a nighttime lab, we go outside and we take a look at the stars. And uh, we have seen them here. Uh-huh. You know, that would be interesting. I, th I think people who saw a bunch of objects moving in tandem, looking like it was coordinated motion, might actually add to people thinking that they saw something like that, definitely. Um, 
a sky is a connection to nature, um, and there are cultures all over the world that use the sky to share their traditions, their history, and knowledge. And an indigenous astronomer from, um, from Australia gave the following quote, in the same way that our lands were colonized, our skies are now being colonized. And I think this is an important uh, thing to note. Um, the sky belongs to everyone, but somehow the FCC can allow a single US corporation to alter the sky all over the world. And I think that's what we're really talking about here, is that the sky is being altered by these corporations without consent. So you might be wondering what astronomers are doing about it. Well, the International Astronomical Union has actually put together a center for the protection of the dark and quiet sky from satellite constellation interference. Never let astronomers name things. We do these horrible long things. At least they didn't give it an acronym. Um, and this is another case where we're doing a long exposure photograph. So the motion that is all together, that sort of curved motion, is the motion of the sky. And then you can see the streaks that are going in a different direction that show you uh, these satellite constellations. Um, so uh, the International Astronomical Union, which represents astronomers all over the world, is trying to basically be the lobbying group to go to the UN and stuff like that and say, can we finally actually come up with some international law that deals with space? Because right now there is something called the Outer Space Treaty, but its, own, its only signatories are countries, not corporations. And so it's a very different mindset here. And then, um, as I've seen from the expressions on many of your faces, because the eyes, even though you're masked, the eyes have really shown some of your expressions, right? Um, there are no binding rules of uh, monitoring mega constellations. Uh, SpaceX is, on average, launching 50 new satellites per week. Um, and if you, uh, the only thing I can say here is, if you are concerned about this, make sure you contact your public uh, representatives because this actually looks like it should be a change to environmental law um, and international law. And I think, you know, what drew me to astronomy is the beauty of the sky, but the sky is being altered and our potential to explore the sky is being altered and not necessarily um, with our ability to have a say in it. So if you would like to have a say in it, this is what I would ask you to consider doing. Um, and I know that's probably more of a bummer than, uh, than most astronomy talks, but it actually is a topic that I think is flying under the radar. And that maybe as uh, I would just like to thank you for letting me to come here and talk about it. So thank you very much. Hold on. Am I off there? Oh, sorry. Uh, the professor says she can stay until 12.30, so if you have questions, that's the time to ask them. Um, um, we'll say that we, uh, so for questions, we'll do after, we'll after, do after. after the assembly. She's going to stay, so we'll have some time to do that after. And we definitely like, like to keep the questions to after the assembly, just to keep things moving, because every once in a while, not in this case at all, but we get derailed and, and it's hard to get back on track. But we are on track all the way. So I'm going to turn it over to Kristen, who's going to tell you about a breakout session we're going to do right now. Kristen? Our <laughs> no. So um, we're so glad to see so many of you here today. And as you know, in between our monthly assembly, we often have events. Um, we usually call them meetup because that's where we advertise them, but we might branch out. Um, and in the past, we've had a lot of different types of events. And as society is opening up and we're doing more events, we want to get your input. And so what we would like is for all of us to get in small groups. I will be facilitating the Zoom group, but um, until then, I'll help us get into our groups. We have post-it notes on the floor. Um, there's three on this side, there's one back there. Are there any other? And another one on this side. Um, and so we'd like to be relatively evenly dispersed. I think there's about 35 of us here. So we're talking about six or seven people in a group. 
Um, and we'll have a Sunday assembly organizer in each group. And everyone is going to have a piece of paper like this and we'll pass out some pens. But first you get to just kind of talk and brainstorm and look at your list. And so your questions are, of the events that we've done in the past, whether you've been to them or not, which ones look really great and that you would like to go to? And your other question is, what other events can we plan that maybe are not on this list, that aren't there, that you think Sunday assemblers would enjoy? So past events, which ones look good and that you'd like to see repeated, and what else? And also, if you are someone who wants to help organize, we would possibly pair you with an experienced organizer to help host said event. So talk amongst yourselves at your post-it notes and then everyone fill out one of these um, and you'll put these on the welcome table um, when you leave. Any questions about the questions? All right, so find a post-it note group to be in and I'm going over to the iPad to be with the Zoomblers. All right, thank you very much. Um, the board has taken all the information that you gave us and a super efficient group, there's eight of us. Um, so we've already, um, we're gonna be doing most of these events tomorrow. Um, there's enough events for each of you to have one, so the sign-up sheet's in the back, so um, there'll be one organizer and one person at each event, so it should be fun, so Monday's gonna be great. Um, so we have a, a sing-along with Mr. Paul Svensson, um, who, is, uh, who is wonderful, and um, in his uh, instead, we are going to be listening, uh, watching a video with Paul singing Nothing More by the Alternative Roots, a wonderful, wonderful, very Sunday Assembly song. Please do. Poor Paul. Oh, we can I say something? So just, just uh, of note, Paul Svensson, for 25 Assemblies, has been online at his house playing the guitar, pretending that he's that he's, that he's looking at a crowd of people. And when we're done, he says, y'all sounded great. And you believe him. So let's do that for Paul here right now. This is an easy little song. If you don't know it, it's easy to pick up. You'll kiss the tune, then you can join in. Or you can just make up your own tune because nobody else can hear you. Doesn't matter to me, it's a folk song. Here we go. To be humble, to be kind. It is the giving of the peace in your mind. To a stranger, to a friend. To give in such a way that has no end. We are love. We are one. We are how we treat each other when the day is done. We are peace and we are war. We are how we treat each other, nothing more. Let's do that chorus again, then you get it. Oh, we are love, we are one. We are one. We are how we treat each other when the day is done. We are peace, and we are war. We are how we treat each other, nothing more. To be bold, to be brave. It is the thinking that the heart can still be saved. And darkness can come quick. Danger is in the anger. And hanging on to it, we are love, we are one, we are how we treat each other when the day is done, we are peace, and we are war, we are how we treat each other, nothing more, a little different here, tell me what it is that you see, world that's filled with endless possibilities. 
Heroes, they don't look like they used to. They look like you. We are alone. We are one. We are how we treat each other when the day is done. We are peace. And we are war. And we are how we each other, nothing more. One more time on the chorus. We are love, we are one, we are one. We are how we treat each other when the day is done. We are peace, and we are war. Yes, and we treat each other, nothing more. We are how we treat each other, nothing more. Oh, we are how we treat each other, nothing more. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, we're going to have a second reading today. Uh, <clears throat> today is June 19th, uh, uh, known as Juneteenth, which became a federal holiday uh, last year in 2021. Here is the description of Juneteenth uh, from PBS.org uh, article. The holiday's origins story begins in Galveston, Texas. Texas was the westernmost area of the Union in 1865. When enslaved people were told that their emancipation on June 19th, 1865, they technically had already been freed two and a half years prior when President Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation on January 1st, 1863. The, the enslaved people's holders in Texas had kept the information to themselves, extending the period of violent exploitation of slain people, enslaved people. In the following years, in 1866, a celebration was held in Texas the first Juneteenth observance to be recognized uh, freedom from slavery in the U.S. Um, and uh, obviously it's a shocking event uh, that, that, that people would do this, but we see what people would do so we know. But uh, shocking more that uh, I didn't know about June, June, June 19th, Juneteenth until a few years ago. That's shocking. Um, our second reading is uh, Won't You Celebrate With Me by Lucille Clifton, read by Laura Haywood. Laura? Won't you celebrate with me what I have shaped into a kind of life? I had no model. Born in Babylon, both non-white and woman, what did I see except to be, except myself? I made it up here on this bridge between starshine and clay, one hand holding tight my other hand. Come celebrate with me that every day something has tried to kill me and has failed. Both lovely and powerful readings today. Thank you so much. Um, I, I, uh, <clears throat> Got my jury summons uh, here. Uh, I'll be doing my uh, civic duty on uh, June 30th, 2022. Um, just so you know, you can change the date if you want. You can actually go before or after or uh, push it out if you need to. When I was a manager at Costco, I pushed it out all the time until you couldn't push it out anymore. But I'm going to go on this date because weirdly enough, it's, it's th the exact date, 38 years from this date is the date on which I'm going to perish on 2060, June 30th on my birthday, 100 years old. So <laughs> coincidence, I don't know, pretty strange. So that's what I'll be doing for my birthday. Um, but uh, in 10 years ago, I got, also got a jury summons. Um, it was about the same time of year, or April to May. Um, uh, well, the jury summons wasn't, but the trial was. I uh, ended up going downtown. Like most of the times, I get, I, you probably all done jury service, or maybe you have. Uh, you uh, usually get dismissed by 12 or 1 o'clock uh, when they decide they're not going to have any cases. Well, in this time, I got kept at the late afternoon, and I, be, I got pulled onto a jury pool of 100 people. I was juror 97. So I was still pretty sure I was going to be going to work the next day. 
And um, so after two days of deliberation, and uh, uh, 96 save 10 of the jurors um, were bit the dust or were dismissed, um, I, uh, I, I saw my, my uh, I literally saw my, <laughs> my chances of becoming greater and greater. And uh, so I got on this jury trial, and it turned out to be a uh, two-week two week trial, and it was a murder trial. It was a cold case file from 1993. Two sailors that had been murdered down in, um, off of Palm Avenue here, which was undeveloped at the time. It was just a big field um, where people rode their bikes and stuff. And, um, and uh, there was a 20-year-old and a 23-year-old, and they were, um, they were found murdered 40 feet, of, 40 feet apart. And uh, they had the suspects, um, the, they thought had, uh, they found people that had the truck that they had down in Mexico, but those people were never uh, either um, extradited or charged with anything because there wasn't enough evidence. But with the DNA evidence, um, they went back and they looked at it, and they, um, and they reopened the case. They extradited one of the fellows back from Washington State, and um, it was very, very interesting. Um, but it was not the DNA evidence that was the most conclusive thing for the group of people that um, had to make the decision. Um, uh, Edward Jesus Elias and Leopoldo Castro Chavez II uh, were found to be guilty by We 11. Um, the DNA evidence uh, narrowed down one of the suspects to 40,000 in one, that it would be him. But in a, in a, in a city of, uh, in a county of several million people, that's a lot of people, you know, and when you're looking for a uh, reasonable doubt, uh, you need more. And it was the evidence that was collected at the scene that, that really made, uh, in this huge field, that really made the difference. Um, I remember the detective got, got up and he talked about the thing. He had the field, a picture of the field on the screen, and uh, it was all marked off into grids. And he talked about walking the grid. And, um, and he talked about using soft eyes. And I, I had never heard that term before, but when he said it, I, knew, I felt like I knew exactly what he was talking about. Um, I, uh, I, I knew that... Um, I, I use that very, it may be familiar to you too when you say that. I mean, I've used that, that, that the same thing in the warehouse where I work, at the, at the wholesale warehouse where I work, when somebody drops a bottle of wine. Um, you see where the spill is and the wine and the labels kept most of it together and there's a wine spill and we're cleaning that up. But unless you get down and open your eyes up and not look just where the spill was, but at everything, see everything, that's when you can see the little shards all over the place. Um, it's that opening of the eyes. Um, and it's the same thing that, that I've used before, I use pretty much every day when I, because uh, I have this really bad habit of uh, taking all of my vitamin pills in one hand and then shoving them into my mouth all together, all at the same time and drinking them down. But I often drop a pill. Um, I hear where it drops and I can look where it drops, but I don't see it until I open up my eyes and I'm just putting my thing in order today so I don't break down like I did uh, the other day. Um, but, I, you know, I use my soft eyes to see the, the, um, the pill. It's, it's, uh, it's allowing your vision to open up to see the whole picture. Um, to me, it's like the difference between looking and seeing something. And uh, as Detective Bunk in the uh, show The Wire says, if you, if you got soft eyes, you can see the whole thing. If you got hard eyes, you're staring at the same tree, missing the forest. So uh, this concept of soft eyes, I understood pretty much exactly what he meant when he said it. Um, uh, the example in this room would be like if we, if we, we yeah, you can look at me. Uh, hopefully you'll see me uh, at some point when we talk and we'll get to know me a little bit. But if we look around this room, we, you're looking up here, but if we take a moment and we, um, and we uh, open up our eyes and we can see the room that we're in and the people that we're in the room with and the, the gentle breeze that's blowing in here very softly and the sound of the jets in the background and the, the vast space between us and the ocean here and the point and it's just this beautiful last waning days of spring. It's, it's being present in the moment, really. We, we look at, uh, we can use the same concept for people, I think. And we look and assess people all the time. All of us do it. And we make these assessments based on what we know about the type of people that we think we're looking at. That's how we make our assessment. But when we use our soft eyes, we can see the person standing in front of us, and it gives us a better chance to lessen our own prejudices when we see them. Um, 
And, and also, it's, it, you can think about your other senses, because it's, uh, it, it's not just hearing, it's, uh, it's, it's listening, not just hearing, when we use our soft eyes or our soft senses. Or to understand uh, the orbit problem, uh, you can see the massive problem, but you have to look at the individual uh, component pieces that go into this to, uh, to make up the problem. Um, sometimes you have to understand the small thing to be able to understand the big thing. Um, I, I think about that every time when I look at a massive number of deaths, like over a million people dead of COVID, and we know it's much, much higher than that because that's a million people that are reported. And it's a staggering number. I mean, there's more Americans died from COVID disease that has been recorded than from all the Americans that died in the Civil War, all the Americans that died in the World War I, World War II, the Korean War, Vietnam War, all of them. And it's an astounding number when you think of the number. But I think when you, when you, when you think of, when I think of uh, my wife's boss, who no longer has a sister, or the students at um, <coughs> Vivaldi, Texas, who'll go back to school and their classmates won't be there. Or 20-year-old uh, Cliff Ellis or 23-year-old Keith Combs. Those are the two people I didn't tell you about. Uh, those are the two people I didn't tell you about in the murder case. Those are the people who uh, would be 10 years younger than me right now and alive and living their lives here in San Diego, maybe. It's, it's the individual that makes you realize how big the problem is. Um, there, there was a book that was called The War, um, it was Vietnam War Memorials, called The War, Vietnam War Memorials, Mem Remembrances, and it's, uh, it's two pictures of people visiting the war memorial, doing edges and things, sorry. But um, it's, uh, it's got all the notes and things people put on there, and when I read this many, many years ago, it's something that always stuck with me because it, it says this thing about how important just that those little instances in life are that we have. Uh, some woman wrote, I would give anything to share, to shuck one more pecan with you on mom's front porch in the early evening. I don't know why just shucking a pecan, it's just so specific to me sitting on this wood porch, shucking pecans with your sister and having a quiet conversation um, I don't know why that one's so touching, but I just mean it, uh, it evokes that, that, that thing that is the thing we all look for. But we can't always look with soft eyes at everything. Sometimes we have to look at hard eyes with things. Sometimes we can't take the uh, things out. Like when you're in a jury room and you have to make a decision based only on the facts in front of you, you can't take anything into account about the life of this young person who took another life. This, this, these kids that were out drinking and, and took two lives. Uh, who are now men that are facing um, trial and who are still in jail today, prison today, I'm sorry. Um, but if we can use our soft eyes with each other, we can see each other and we can listen to each other and we can touch each other's lives. And I, I know that I would rather be seen than looked at and I will try to do the same for each of you. Thank you. I'm just in an emotional mess today. Sorry, sometimes that happens. Oh, papers are falling. <laughs> All right. Uh, so uh, now if we can take, it was perfect for me, uh, a moment of silent reflection, please. Um, well, we have some events coming up, and uh, last night we had a uh, solstice uh, backyard potluck, which is fantastic uh, for those of you who are there. So good to see you again this morning. And, uh, and for those of you who weren't, we hope that you can make the next event. One of the next events is right here at this venue, and it's uh, 4th of July. Uh, until COVID, our venue had hosted an annual 4th of July, the other Independence Day event of pizza and fireworks. The back patio has, I'm sorry, um, so the back patio here has a gorgeous views of the Harbor Fireworks Show. This year, our venue is allowing Sunday Assembly to co-sponsor this free event. There are limited spots available, and as of a couple of days ago, there are 15, 16 spots left on Meetup. I know one person took one of those spots last night, so sign up on Meetup as soon as you can uh, before it gets filled up. If you don't have access to Meetup, find me or one of the organizers, and we'll get you added in. Um, uh, 
we did this last year. It was amazing. So you can see, I mean, you know, we're, we're a little far away from the fireworks display, but if you don't know, the Bay Fireworks display is um, uh, uh, synchronized to music, and it's uh, several several different displays all at one time, and it's super, super cool to watch it here from the patio. So we'll have food, and we'll be meeting the community that's from here. This place is, it's called the Indoor Sports Club, was the original name for it. An indoor sport, you would think it's like basketball indoors, but an indoor sport as opposed to an outdoor sport, who is somebody who could go outside and be uh, ambulatory and do whatever they want to do. And an indoor sport is somebody who is, you know, say, sitting in, a, uh, maybe has to use some a wheelchair or some other device to help them get around, or can't get around very well and that's an indoor sports this place is made for the indoor sports and so right here it's uh, that's the community that's here so um, uh, it's a uh, hundred uh, percent accessible for just everybody and uh, we'll be uh, uh, feeding and having some pizza and having some apple pie and watching the fireworks there so please please do come to that too long but I really want you to come and so get those spots filled up because um, we, we can't have too many people here last time and that we had less than that and they're giving us 50 um, if you're interested in Sunday Assembly as an attendee or volunteer, please consider attending the 2022 conference. There will be enriching and fun content, and it's an opportunity to meet and bond with assembly-related folks from other states and countries. And check out our Facebook page for more information from travel, stipends, and obtaining free tickets. Um, um, Zoomers, hello, that's you too, please. Uh, please make sure that you're um, asking for the stipends. Uh, the Sunday Assembly in America and the organizers of this event up in Silicon Valley, East Bay, I'm sorry. Uh, it's a California event and they really would like you to come and they're providing lots of help. So please, if you're considering it, I've been to every conference. I'll be missing this one. It'll be my first one missed. There's only four people who have been to every conference for Sunday Assembly and uh, now I'll be down to three. Uh, so that would be Laura and two other people. Um, anyways, but please do come. It's just so rewarding and just you feel like you have uh, friends as we do here uh, all over the world. Um, and then uh, uh, we just one more of Paul Stenson's beautiful singing to us while we're not there. I can see clearly now the rain is strong. I can see all Yes, I can make it now. But yes, I can make it now. The pain is gone. All of the bad feelings have disappeared. Here is that rainbow I've been waiting for. Don't be a bright, bright, sunshine day. There's nothing but blue sky.
guy. He's amazing, just singing in his room all alone. And that's his 1963 Buddy Holly special blue porcelain um, guitar with the stars on that. Because he always tells about, I made that up, but he's always telling about his guitars. Um, our next assembly next month, um, instead of our normal assembly, we invite you to watch the Sunday Assembly International Conference ending, ending celebration. Um, it'd be the same time, same place. Um, details will be posted on the meetup as soon as they're available. Um, we're not exactly sure how we're going to work that out, whether we build a watching community, but um, our next in-person assembly and Zoom assembly will be on August 21st. Um, please join us for coffee, tea, snacks, and feel free to join another assemblage for lunch at Barrio Star after the assembly. I have to say, um, as in the first song that we saw at the top of the assembly, it's, uh, it's staying after and uh, getting to know each other. That's the best part of this whole event. So please do that, and thank you very much for being here. Well, thank you for coming to Sunday Assembly today. Thank you all. Thank you.